So I'm really pleased to introduce our first keynote speaker, Daryl Bryce. Um, <clears throat> and I'm just going to say a little bit about him. He's currently an instructor of sociology and diversity and globalism studies at Highline College, where he's taught since 2003. While teaching at Highline College, he was awarded tenure in 2007. The next year in 2008, he was recognized as faculty member of the year. In 2007, he received the Teachers, Assist Teachers Assisting in Discovery Award. In 2009, he was the recipient of the National Institute for Staff and Development Excellence Award. And he recently won the 2018 Faculty and Staff of Color Conference Faculty Award of Excellence. I had the pleasure to um, hear his story at the Diversity Summit when he presented there. So I was delighted when he accepted our ask to come and speak with all of you. So please give a welcome to Daryl. Good morning. 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 Y'all a little flat. Good morning. Good morning. I wanted to say, you know, what's up, whack? But you know, whack and hip hop culture mean something different. So, <laughs> you know, I'm gonna refrain from that. Good to go. Yeah. Who's going to wander around? I ain't gonna wonder. I think I I stay stay close to the computer. All right. So I was thrilled when Kathleen reached out to me to talk about you know sort of looking at engagement through an equity lens. She saw me at a diversity institute, and it's kind of ironic that I'm here talking at a Canvas conference because I was a long time holdout to you know e-learning. Right? We're gonna we're gonna get into that in a in a little bit. So it's you know great to be here. So first things first. Anybody know who that is? Darkwing Duck. Man, I got to find, I always need to find my fellow geeks. All right? So, you know, I like to identify that early, so I appreciate y'all, right? And I always start with Darkwing Duck because, you know, he was this, this brilliant, you know, sort of cartoon that I didn't appreciate till like 15 years later, right? He would always appear in a puff of smoke and, you know, would say witty things like, you know, I'm Darkwing Duck. I'm the cholesterol that clogs up the arteries of your heart, right? And it was like 15 years later, I appreciated this. So I always start my speeches talking about Darkwing Duck because if you don't get it now, 15 years later, you might wake up and be like, damn, he was brilliant, <laughs> right? So Maurice Ashley, he's a, a grandmaster, you know, chess player. And one of the things he says in his TED talk is, he says a lot of people think that, you know, chess players have like 30 moves in their head planned ahead. He said, that's not true. He said, what we actually do is practice like the last four or five moves. Because if you're playing against somebody that's good, y'all are going to get down, you know, to like four or five pieces left a piece, right? And so he says, for chess players, one of the things that they do is they like to, you know, start with the end in mind or think backwards. And that's the way they solve a lot of their, you know, problems. So I thought that would be a good place for us to start. Sound good? All right. So instead of talking about engagement, let's talk about some of these antonyms, right? Disengaged, inoperable, not working, you know, uninvolved. Sounds like, you know, some of the students you might encounter in your classroom, right? You're trying to get them, you know, locked in, want them to be involved in the material, but they might not be. And I want to, you know, talk about why they might not be engaged, right, through an equity lens, right? Especially students of color. So before we start, I always like to invoke some of the ancestors, you know, bring them in the room with us. So this is a quote by Steve Biko, who was a South African freedom fighter. And he says, the greatest weapon in the hand of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed, right? So always try to encourage educators to think about, you know, how important your job actually is, right? Are you educating for liberation or are you educating for, you know, to keep people oppressed? And then I love the Malcolm X quote, right? I love this. Only a fool would let his enemy educate his children. Makes a lot of sense to me, right? So as a jumping off point, I always start conversations like this about, you know, what is education actually? It's, you know, funny how many people really don't know about the root word, you know, in education, which is to reduce and to think about it from, you know, that point of view, which means to bring out some latent trait that's already there, right, in your students, 
right? Not this banking model that Paulo Freire, you know, sort of argued against that you just depositing stuff into your students and want them to spit it back out to you, right? On, you know, tests or exams. Does that make sense? All right, so we're trying to bring out stuff that's already in there, you know, in our students. So how do we go about doing that, you know, in an in-face class or in an online, you know, community? The next thing I talk about is this notion of education versus training, All right? Bobby Wright talked about this in the psychopathic racial personality. You know, people that's interested in race always tell them, check that book out. Right? You might not like what you hear, but it's important, you know, for you to hear it. And he says there's a difference between education and training. He says education is, you know, when you're doing something to help people better themselves as an individual that they can then take back to their communities and help them better their communities. He says training is when the oppressor, you know, gives the individual something that can help the oppressor live a better life and help them, you know, build up their communities. He says that's the distinction. And I always put this picture up here because the example he gave was, you know, a dog. He was like, when you see a dog teaching, you know, its pups how to bark and defend itself against, you know, possible intruders or things that can hurt it, that's education, right? When you dress that dog up in a top hat and have it riding around on a unicycle and doing all that kind of stuff and jumping through hoops, that's training, right? That's for the master's, you know, approval to make them feel better. That ain't got nothing to do with the dog living a better life. Does that make sense? All right. And so, you know, think about that in terms of, you know, what we do in the classrooms. So I always argue that one of the way that institutions operate is, and the reason we see so many gaps and so many disparities is because it's still operating on this equality model, right? We're past that, we're on the equity model. And there's a really easy way to you know, break that down. Equality is treating everybody the same. Equity is making sure people are getting what they need to be successful, all right? This is why you can't have a production line mentality when you're talking about you know, teaching. You have to think about how it's affecting and impacting, you know, individual students with individual, you know, sort of um, uh, social identities and so on and so forth. So the reason that picture is up there, I always joke, I'd be like, man, because, you know, diversity and equity work to send you to the hospital. Right? That's partly true. But the example that I always use when I talk about the difference between equity and equality is the emergency room example. How many of y'all have been in the emergency room? All right, good, honest. Right? Usually when I ask that question, like two people put their hands up, and I'm always like, y'all the healthiest damn crowd I've ever seen. Right? So when you're in the emergency room, you see varying degrees of problems, right? Somebody might have a broken leg, somebody's eye might be hanging out the socket, somebody might have a virus. You know, an equality model is the doctor comes out there and says, okay, today is aspirin day. No matter what's wrong with you, everybody getting aspirin. Right? We're going to just treat everybody the same. An equity model would be for the doctor to come out and assess what your problem is and then, you know, address that and fix you. Make sense? All right, that's the, the sort of distinction between, you know, equity and equality. So these are some demographics, you know, right, for K through 12 in the state of Washington from OSPI, all right? And if you look, you see what student tends to have a teacher that sort of comes from their same cultural background, might sound like them, might teach like them. Right? And so when you think about so-called achievement gaps, right, very few people acknowledge that this might be a reason for it. Right? If I went around the room, y'all could probably give me a whole bunch of reasons for the achievement gap. Nobody talks about you know, this as a reason. Right? It goes you know, even deeper than that. So I always talk about Antonio Gramsci. Anybody know Gramsci? All right, a few folks. Y'all must be in philosophy and social sciences or something. Nobody else knows Gramsci. He's an Italian Marxist, you know, theorist, and he was actually jailed under Mussolini's regime, right? But one of the things that he sort of started to develop was this notion of hegemony, right? And he says hegemony is the ability to control, not just by force, although the oppressor will use force, but the, you know, control by controlling people's worldview, by, you know, how they see themselves and how they see other people, right? Because if you can get them to do that, they'll automatically do what it is you want them to do. You don't have to force them to do anything. They'll think that that's the right thing to do. Right? That's hegemony, and that's how that you know, sort of operates. And so I argue, if you saw my description, that the problem with a lot of you know, sort of instruction is we teach like we were taught to, which is very problematic, because a lot of us were taught to in ways that was not effective, we didn't enjoy it, and was very problematic. And yet we start our classes and then mimic some of those same behaviors. One of the most liberating things that happened to me when I you know, started teaching was I had a mentor that was like, man, be yourself. Right? Don't try to be anybody else. Be yourself. You know, do your classes the way that you see fit, the way that you think you can get the best you know, learning outcomes. Right? Don't follow you know, a cookie-cutter model of what a teacher is supposed to be like. Right? 
And so I've always argued that our educational institutions are built on, you know, white norms, right? I always joke, you know, I was, you know, hired to teach white sociology. It's not what I teach, but that's what I was hired to teach, right? In sociology, we have, you know, what's called the big three, right? Marx, Weber, Durkheim, all old dead white men, which I'm sure y'all got a lot in y'all fields, right? And I always ask students, you know, especially when I take them down a rabbit hole and start teaching them about, you know, different types of inequalities, and we start to talk about different types of theorists, and they like, man, you talk a lot about black people. I'm like, have you ever sat in the class and wondered why you won't never learn about black people? All right, have you ever asked, has anybody, you know, any people of color contributed anything to history, philosophy, psychology, sociology? Have women contributed anything to these fields? All right. It's like you never asked that question. That's how hegemony works, right? Whiteness is our default setting. That's the norm. So when it comes across that way, you don't question it. Just like when I showed you all those disparities in teaching. My partner is here today. She just completed her dissertation. That's Dr. Harden over there. I'm so proud of you, right? But she looked at, you know, microaggressions and that black male students, you know, experience, right? And one of the things she always talk about is when we look at these disparities, we rarely name things like racism or sexism, right, as a, you know, problem in terms of what might be, you know, giving us these disparities and in in these different learning outcomes, right? Nobody wants to get at sort of the root of the problem, but that's how hegemony works, right? We're not trained to, you know, question the system, right? But we have to question the system. We have to question the system. The other thing that I like to do is, you know, it's called the, you know, hegemony activity. If y'all bear with me, you know, a little bit, Close your eyes. I make sure nobody steal your stuff. I'm right, be your security guard for the next, you know, 10, 20 seconds or so. All right. So close your eyes. I'm gonna just, you know, throw out some titles, and you're gonna get some pictures in your head. And this is how hegemony actually works, right? You don't have to tell anybody what these pictures are, but you're gonna get some images. All right. Close your eyes real quick. College professor. Astronaut. Dentist. Gang member, welfare recipient, all right, inmate. Did y'all get some images? Did you see some things? All right, what y'all get for college professor? An old white man, right? That's a damn shame, me too. <laughs> but that's how hegemony works, all right? You didn't picture me, even though I was standing there lecturing right before you closed your eyes. Right, she read my bio, all the teaching awards. You were like, oh, that's a professor. Right? And that's the danger we run into, too, in our classrooms. Right? I always tell people, I got a PhD in spite of my professors, not because of my professors. Right? Because they didn't see me as you know, the ideal student or you know, the person that you know, was getting those A's in the classroom. I literally had a professor one time call my name out when he was handing the test back and was looking for me, even though I was waving my hand, like he couldn't associate that the person that got the highest grade in the class was, you know, the only black kid in the class, right? And that was college, right? So this is, you know, how hegemony sort of operates. This is why we have to, you know, be on guard against, you know, those kind of things. That's Howard Zinn. People ever read Howard Zinn? Hey, People's History of the United States, right? One of the functions of hegemony, according to Gramsci, is the educator function. He said this is one of the ways that it takes place. Right? If the oppressor can control the educational system, they can control all of the information that people then that go through that system receive. So they'll automatically see things as normal and automatically see other things as problematic or bad. A good quick example would be if you mentioned communism in one of your classes, even though your students probably know nothing about it, would they have a positive or a negative connotation associated with it? Because they raised in a capitalist society. Right? You see how quickly that can work? Whether they ex examined or studied it or not, they'll already have right, a bias, you know, one way or another, right, towards it. One of my favorite quotes from Zen is he says, omission is worse than lying, right? Because if I omit something, it's as if it never existed. If I lie to you, at least you have the basis to go check it out, right? So think about all of people's, you know, histories that have been omitted, right, throughout our disciplines, throughout our fields. And think about if we're reproducing that, or if we're going against the grain and making sure that students are getting what they're supposed to get. Are they seeing themselves in our curriculum, right? Are they seeing themselves as important in our fields? Are they seeing themselves as people that can contribute to our fields, right? Because one of the ways that, you know, this hegemony happens is we just omit things. 
So this is my uh, my son. This is a, a good example of you know how omission is you know worse than lying. All right. He was smarter than me at like age four. All right. So one day I picked him up from Montessori school. I always laugh. I'm like, damn, my son had a record when he was like four. All right. One of the things at Montessori school, if you have an incident, right, they write it up, they put it in an envelope, and then they hand it to you when you go pick your kid up, right? So I go pick my son up. She comes running over. She was like, Mikey choked somebody today. And I'm like, man, what did they do to him? Right? Sound like you're telling one side of the story, but okay. All right. So I asked him. I was putting him in the car. I said, Mikey. I thought she said Aaron. I said, Mikey, did you choke Aaron, you know, today? And he looked me dead in my face. He was like, no. Wasn't worth it. I buckled him up. We get home. I open the letter. The letter says Owen. Right? So I go back to Mikey. I'm like, Mikey. I thought you told me you ain't choked nobody today. He said, I didn't say that. You asked me if I choked Aaron today. <laughs> it's like, boy, you knew what the hell I was talking about. You knew some choking went on, right? But he just omitted that it was Owen that he choked. So he did choke somebody. It just wasn't Aaron, right? So that's how, you know, omission versus lying works. Right? So I like to talk a little bit about my field. All right, forget talking about other people's disciplines. In sociology, when we talked about the big three earlier, I always talk about the big four, right? Du Bois is, you know, one of the people that gets left off. He was a pioneer of American sociology that damn near nobody has to read to get a PhD in the field of sociology, all right? How much reading do you think I had to do of Du Bois' work to get a PhD in sociology? Zero. Pioneer of American sociology, all right? Zero Du Bois that I have to read, you know, to get my degree. All right, this is how, you know, sort of brilliant he was. First off, you know, after he graduated, he graduated from historically black college and applied to Harvard. Harvard said, because you graduated from historically black college, we don't believe your degree is sufficient. So if you want to come here, you have to take two more years of undergrad, right? Get this white education. Du Bois is like, all right, cool. Did that. End up getting his master's degree then end up getting into a, you know, doctoral program at Harvard. He was the first person of African descent to get a PhD from Harvard. All right, we're talking late 1800s. You know how hard that was? I'm always, you know, baffled by how why people ain't impressed by that. This is a black man, the late 1800s got a PhD from Harvard. It's hard to get a PhD from Harvard now. He was a black dude in the late 1800s, right, got a PhD from Harvard. He was one of the first to use this method called triangulation, right, in terms of looking at data when he, you know, wrote his book, The Philadelphia Negro. All right? He was a towering beast. In fact, there's a new book out called The Scholar Denied, and they argue that some of Du Bois' work was probably plagiarized by, you know, what we now know as the Chicago School, where the first Department of Sociology was in the United States. All right? That's how brilliant, you know, this, you know, guy was. But, you know, largely omitted, you know, from the field of sociology. And as Joyce Ladner said, but sociology like history, by the way, she wrote this really good book called Death of White Sociology, right? She was a sociologist as well, also involved in the civil rights movement. But sociology, like history, economics, and psychology, exists in a domain where color, ethnicity, and social class are of primary importance. And as long as this holds true, it is impossible for sociology to claim that it maintains value neutrality in this approach. All right, now, I'm guessing a lot of our fields, you know, suffer from this problem. So this is one of my sort of favorite, you know, comics, right, because it really shows you the how our students are sort of, you know, marginalized and how they can be, you know, marginalized in our, you know, classes. Because the academy don't allow them to tell their stories. And if you can't see, you know, the caption, it says, I expect all of you, I expect you all to be independent, innovative, critical thinkers who will do exactly as I say. All right? And that's sort of the way I felt going through, you know, my college experience. You're like, yeah, we want you to be yourself. I remember in grad school, I wrote a paper on, you know, hip hop and Marxism. And when I was talking to my professor about it, he was like, man, you ain't going to be able to do it. You ain't going to be able to do it. I ended up getting an A on the paper. And he ended up asking me for the paper after I graduated because he was writing something on pop culture and Marxism. All right? I was like, yeah, man, you should. You know, trusted me a little bit. I knew what the hell I was doing. All right? So much so that you needed my work. All right? So with that, this is an article that me and a buddy of mine, he's at the University of Cincinnati in the social department, you know, published. Right, it's called Relationships Proceed Learning, Reflections on Being and Teaching you know, Students of Color. Right, so it's in this edited you know, version called uh, Reflections on Academic Lives. And it's in chapter six, which is called The Art of Teaching Really is an Art. Right, it really is. It really is this you know, sort of performance piece. But these are you know, sort of five things that, you know, low stakes you know, tips that 
we offered at the end of our, you know, article, you know, given our experiences as, you know, being black males in, you know, higher ed. And one of the first things we talked about is, you know, being creative in non-instructional time and also, you know, create space for non-course related, you know, sort of discussions, right? You know, how are you making room for your students to engage you and then, you know, you engage them back, right? How are you doing that? And so we suggested, you know, things like showing up to class early, right? Ask the students how they, you know, doing. One of the things that, you know, he mentioned to me, he was like, man, I love the way that you, he called it holding court, right? Five, 10 minutes before, you know, class start, I'm just, you know, shooting the breeze with him. How was your weekend? What'd you do? What's going on? All right? Anything happened? How are people feeling? Good? Bad? All right? What's going on? And, you know, students willing, you know, lock in and engage, which is, you know, what we want. Oh, we're doing this, we're doing that. And if you're really skillful, a student will say something that can segue you into your lecture. All right? So, you know, they like, oh, and then you base it off of their lived experiences and they're really locked in and engaged. All right? So that's one technique. Another one is to create student-centered, you know, assignments, right? What are your assignments, you know, asking of students? All right, are you asking them about themselves? Are you asking them to include some of their personal experiences? Or, you know, do you have, you know, what you have in mind in terms of, you know, a good as assignment, right? Or will they be allowed to do hip hop and Marxism? All right, are you open to that? The other one is, you know, allow yourself to be vulnerable. This is a, you know, huge one that, you know, we'll come back to, you know, in a little bit. Because I find it, you know, strangely odd that we ask students to do a lot of things that we're not willing to model. All right. I ask students all of the time, who's your so-and-so teacher? Uh, I said, like, you don't know their name? We five weeks in. All right? Uh, you know, it's the guy with the glasses. With the... So, I mean, hey, professor, there's a lot of professors with glasses, damn it. All right? Five weeks in. I'm like, damn. And then I start asking them, so what do you know about them? They're like, what are you talking about? Like, do they have kids? Where did they go to school? Did they struggle, you know, in school? Did... What are some of their experiences with education? And they're like, I, I don't know. Uh, they just get straight to the lecture. They lecture and then they leave, right? I'm like, damn, right? But, you know, we'll have assignments where we ask them to reveal stuff to us, right? But if we haven't done it for them, why do we expect them to, you know, do it for us, right? So, you know, allow yourself to be vulnerable. It's not, you know, easy, but, you know, allow yourself to do it. And then the, the last one is spend time at student-centered, you know, campus events, right? As much as you can. If you have student athletes in your class, I like to go to my, you know, students, you know, athletic events. I like to hang out in the, you know, the student union. Sometimes I just sit over there, you know, have lunch so, you know, I can be amongst them and, you know, see them in some of their own spaces, right? And then I like to use it to mess with them in class, especially if they don't like to talk. I'm like, man, I just seen your ass talking, <laughs> right? I know you can talk. I saw it. Right? Matter of fact, you didn't shut up the whole time I was eating lunch. Right? So say something. Right? And then they'll you know, they start laughing at them, break the ice, and then they'll usually you know, participate. Right? So some of these can be you know, translated to the wonderful world of online teaching. Right? And I'll put that up there sarcastically because I was a long time you know, hold out because I couldn't figure out, first of all, what online teaching looked like. Right? And secondly, how I could engage students you know, in an online environment the way that I do, you know, face to face, right? So that was something I, you know, really struggled with. And I actually started teaching online out of spite. Right? I'll just say it was somebody that wasn't, you know, pulling a load, you know, in our department. I was like, man, I'm gonna need one of them classes. Right? That's, you know, sort of how it, how it started out. But once I got in an online environment, I was like, oh, some of the things that, you know, we talked about for in-class actually apply to, you know, online, you know, teaching, right? So one of them is this idea of creating student-centered assignments, right? That notion that you can create this, you know, assignment that's, you know, very, you know, student-centered, you know, online. Because one of the things that happens in an online environment is students are, you know, really honest which I appreciated way more so than, you know, in class. So I didn't put it up here, but at the end of the introduction to sociology class, there's race, class, and gender. So all of the, you know, the hot topics, right? So they build, teach you, you know, concepts, theories all the way up to the end. And then the way the textbook goes is it drops race, class, and gender on them at the end. So last one is race. I always tell students uh, it's last, you know, so I can pitch y'all off and then y'all gone. <laughs> yeah. It's partly true. Yeah. But, <laughs> but 
in the online environment, you know, they have some some really difficult, you know, readings, you know, around race. And I try to scaffold as much as possible with, you know, like videos and TED Talks and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Right? But one of the, the comments that I got that I could never get students to say in class, especially international students, because I want them to, you know, sort of think about their socialization, right, especially in terms of how they feel about, you know, black men, given that they probably never met one until they got, you know, to Highline or, or, you know, got to, you know, Washington, right? And so a student in an online environment, after reading the article, she admitted, she was like, look, I was told to stay away from, you know, black men. And they have my picture. They know, you know, I'm a black male. They know exactly who I am. I was told to, you know, avoid, you know, black men in particular and, you know, black people in general, you know, when I came to the United States, right? Because they were, you know, criminals, problematic, so on and so forth. I, I'm reading this, I'm like, wow. And then she followed up with, but I have some, you know, classmates that are black, right? And I realized that that wasn't the case, right? That's not true. And I'm very fortunate to have had that opportunity. <clears throat> In class, I would have never gotten that level of, you know, honesty, right? Because I've asked, I'm like, you know, tell me, tell me what you've, you know, heard. Tell me where your images come from. Most of the time it's media, right? You know, media does a terrible job of representing Right, people that's not part of dominant culture, right? And so a lot of that, you know, is you know problematic most of the time. But the one that I put up there was, you know, from a student that was, you know, sort of organizing their thoughts around this assignment. So this was a student of color, and you know, he was talking about his experiences after re reading Benia Silva's work on, you know, racial grammar. Right? He said, you know, for instance, some people believe that intelligence is innate, which is inherited from family, or on the other hand, some people believe that intelligence is acquired to learn. This idea is hidden racism, because when we say intelligence is inherited, we discourage students who study hard because we put pressure on them to feel unsuccessful for those who are classified under less intelligence. Then he really, you know, linked into this, you know, notion of, you know, what the article was talking about. This also has multiple problems because it prevents teachers and other communities from putting effort into educating minorities who frequently, you know, classified by races as less intelligent. I was like, oh, this dude is going in. Like, you know, he's really, you know, getting it. And this is a portion of an assignment where the very last part of the assignment is, you know, can you connect something you read to a personal experience? Right, so when we talk about, you know, like student-centered assignments, right, how can you connect this to a personal experience that you've had? So these students are going from the abstract to theoretical to something, you know, really tangible, right? And that's what I, you know, want them to do with sociology. Most of sociology is applied, right? So I'm locking into, you know, this notion of trying to tap into that idea that, you know, they need to, you know, really look at their personal experiences and that they can be the, you know, sort of experts. In terms of, you know, being vulnerable, right, there are a couple things, you know, you can think about. What do you tell students about yourself? What do they know about your interests, right? And do you give them an opportunity to tell you about themselves? Right? How are you doing that in sort of an online, you know, environment? Right? Or are you doing that? And so one of the things that I found out was the more that I shared you know, with them about me, the more that I would get back, you know, in return. And I was starting to get that engagement piece that I was worried about losing, you know, in an online environment. So, I'm going through a midlife crisis. It's all good. My body can't do the things that it used to do. I've been an athlete my whole life. It's starting to break down on me a little bit, right? I don't recover, right, as, as well as I used to. So I started running these, you know, obstacle course races like Spartan and Tough Mudders, right? I need to test myself. I need to know that I can still move and climb stuff and, you know, run. I can do it all with a little bit of moderation, right, if my knees let me, right? So what I started doing was I would tell them about the races, right? I'm like, look, I got these races coming up. And they started, you know, sending me stuff like, well, good luck. Let me know what the results are. Hope your old ass make it. No, nah, ain't nobody say that. <laughs> Nobody said that. But you know, they would send me all this, you know, cool stuff, right? And so after I would run the races, I would start posting my pictures, right? And he's like, oh man, they really love the one with, you know, me, my face in the mud. That sucked. I hate being dirty. I can't stand it, right? And then your mind starts playing tricks on you when you're going through the mud. You're like, man, there's been hundreds of people that came through here before. <laughs> the hell did they do in this mud? Right? They be splashing all in your face, and you, uh, uh. that's why I look like that. I'm like, oh. <laughs> like, damn it, right? 
So I, after I posted these, they started sending me pictures of things that, you know, they do. So I had a power lift in one of my classes. He sent me a video of him, you know, deadlifting un ungodly amounts of weight. All right. If you ever seen powerlifting competitions, I'm talking, you know, like blood shooting out of his nose. And I was like, man, are you okay? I had to, you know, email him back. Like, you know, he's like, yeah, man, it's just the pressure that builds up. You know, that's just what happens when you power lift. I'm like, man, maybe you shouldn't power lift then. <laughs> blood shooting out your nose from an activity don't seem normal to me. Right? And then, you know, people would send me stuff about their races and, you know, all kinds of cool things started happening in this, you know, online environment that I thought was, you know, sort of real sterile and that I couldn't, you know, engage students in. I was like, damn. And so, you know, I still like being in class, but I'm learning to love the, you know, online environment a, a lot more because I can engage in, you know, different ways that I couldn't engage, you know, in, you know, regular classes. All right. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Um, look Kathleen there. How much time do I have? The quarter. All right, cool. So let's. <laughs> can't tell the professor that. We're like, oh, we got time. So at your your tables, right? Think about ways that you could apply, you know, some of these, you know, five, you know, tips in an online environment. All right. Partly for my own selfishness, I would love to know, you know, things that I could take away you know, and, and use in my online environment, right? So it's great to be amongst all the, uh, you know, experts, right? So discuss at your table, you know, ways that, you know, you might be able to apply some of these, you know, five tips. And if you have, you know, other ones, you know, add to the list. All right, we'll do it, what, five minutes? All right, five minutes. So, great discussions. Those of you that's doing workshops, man, I set y'all up good. I got them all engaged, they talking. So now y'all just gotta run with it from here. All right. all right, Kathleen has a mic if anybody wants to share, if any good ideas came about. What did y'all talk about? I know, I laugh, I always tell students, I'm like, man, teachers are the worst students. <laughs> hey, we got somebody. Uh, so I love to travel, and I love to experience different cultures in my travel. And so I always try to put up the last some pictures of yeah. the last trip, and with my online students. And I realized when the fact that happened, when I was walking through the hall, the first of these students, I had never physically seen talking about the cool this tech instructor. That's right. The world. That's and right. It's really special for me because many of the students have a lot more Washington mm -hmm. or even their city. Yep. And so I like to talk to them about, you know, just having dreams or you know, travel with one of my dreams. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. I'm from here to DC, and I'm sharing my two colleagues that are in tech. Um, thank you to share this comment with my group. We ran out of time. I work with the students with disabilities on campus. We yep. have services for them here. So when I'm looking at this list, I'm also thinking about how can we embed accessibility and UDL and our social diversity points. And one, um, I thought I might add to creating student-centered assessments is allowing for multiple different ways a student can complete that assignment or run the assessment. Absolutely. And, um, I, there's this wonderful woman who works for our state board now who used to be a professor, and she, through her time working with my um, students specifically, learned that Rather than asking everyone to write a paper on whatever topic, they could get a paper if they wanted, they could complete the exam that she had composed, mm -hmm. or they could do an audiovisual component. So students got to pick how to design their response to play through their strength. 
which is creative and student centered, but also beauty happy. Yep. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Kathleen behind you. Cool. She does a very cool thing with the acclimated. So uh, we just talked about being vulnerable. Yeah. Uh, I actually do that here with it. When I go into class, because I was doing this last year, all I knew was that they had to do a reaper energy. Yeah. And uh, sometimes you can see it tomorrow. And she drills it in my room to class, and I still do that for a living. Yeah. And I had to show what's going on. You know, man, awesome. Man. You're really awesome. Man. I had a rough day at work. Yeah, great, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Kathleen behind you. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And I always tell people to, you know, to use that with a, a sense of intelligence. Like, you don't want to post when you got blasted. You know what I mean? When you was plastered at, you know, somebody's wedding or, you know, something like that. You know, you know use your, your common sense and your comfort level. You know, like, you know, what's comfortable for you. But I will say, think about pushing that, you know, a little bit. You know, are you uncomfortable because it could get you in trouble? Or are you uncomfortable because you don't like sharing, you know, yourself with your students? You know, I think there's a distinction, right? So, you know, which, which, where's the discomfort coming from? Am I worried about, you know, like violating, you know, campus policies or, you know, I shouldn't be talking about this, you know, with students? Or is it just, oh, I didn't got used to, you know, this sort of sage on the stage model where I'm the giver of knowledge, right? And it just flows one way, right? So, yeah, always, you know, make sure you protect yourself in, you know, thinking before you, you know, post and what you post and what you're willing to share. But also, you know, push yourself a little bit, too. If it's just discomfort for, you know, the sake of being discomfort, I don't usually share these things, then I would say, you know, at least try it right a little bit. But yeah, I don't want anybody losing their job. I saw your keynote. I'm unemployed now. I don't want that. All right, there. We talked about, I guess, and Mm -hmm. So you post writer again to the writer. So what would you do if you had an image and you post something that you can do? Yeah. What's the deal happening on how it's off the simple, easy, but then you start a lot of conversation? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, That's great. great. That's, That's great. great. Especially because it's, you know, if it's just an image, image is up to interpretation, too. too. Yeah. Hey, Chris Tyler. Exactly. <laughs> it, it, yep, it is. Yeah, I always joke. I'm like, man, we got some 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 agents in the crowd. Yes. Yeah. For, for sure. Yeah. I appreciate it. 
Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Man. So, you know, the way that I've been able to connect, especially with, you know, my military students is I tell them, you know, sort of my story about how I was able to, you know, sort of go to college. And the reason I was able to go to college was because I grew up in, you know, West Baltimore, a single parent mom. She had three boys, you know, that she raised. It's 10 years between me and the next one, 13 between, you know, me and the oldest. When the oldest turned 18, he went in the Navy and sent his checks home so that I could go to Catholic school. Right. Because the Baltimore public school system was that jacked up and it's still that jacked up. I think the last statistic I saw was 76 percent of African-American males don't graduate high school in Baltimore. Seventy six percent. Right. And the city at that time was like 88 percent black. Right. So to circumvent that. Right. Him and my mother sacrificed a lot. And, you know, so he was in the Navy at 18, docked in, you know, all these places, you know, sending his, you know, checks home. And then that really, you know, sort of, it's an in, you know, to, to resonate with them. And then they like, oh, okay. And then I was like, you know, my brother was Army, right? My other brother was Navy. And they told me, take your ass to college. All right. They was like, man, this ain't for you. I was like, yeah, you're right. I got too many questions. I ain't too good at following orders. Right? But, you know, they, they, they resonate, you know, well with that. So that's sort of, you know, my end there. But I can totally see how you know, students can miss. And, you know, not everybody gonna like you. I always tell people, I'm an acquired taste. I'm like beer. And I'm like, like some people like me, some, some don't. Some students love me, some hate me. It's all good. It's all good. But yeah, I know. My, my, the way that I deliver, my lecture is non-linear because that's the way I was raised. I'm a storyteller. You know, some people get it, some people don't. But, you know, so be it. So be it. Any others? She coming, she coming, she coming. <laughs> that works. your keynote now <laughs> sorry about that so oh, good. Back, backing up just a step by the way i love this you're, you're doing a wonderful job thank you thank you <laughs> <laughs> let me get out your way man <laughs> since you said that you <laughs> anyway so uh, i teach web development and um frequently there's so much um change and there's never a right answer at any moment what i knew yesterday could be a liability today so that's an advantage in our field because I know that I don't know anything and I never will. But luckily, I have people for that. I have all of you. And therefore, I want them to feel like, by the way, I stumbled onto this. This wasn't something I figured out, like everything. And probably it came from a student. But the point is, I have people for that means that, A, I'm not the best at everything. B, we all have value. And we have more value when we value each other. And it's easily demonstrated when you say, hey, that's a great question. I don't know anything about it. Let's take a cursory look. Okay, no obvious answer. So that's worth points. So would you please, if you want at your convenience, take a look, let me know what you think. We'll share it with the group, you'll get points. And so that's really effective because then people get rewarded and the whole class gets rewarded. And every time it's successful, we repeat it so that the students see how they have people for that. And then that was the group work starts to build a community that's effective in a uh, situation where um, the edge is receding at all times because we don't know where it's always going to go. So thank you. Thank you. That was William, everybody. <laughs> Are there any more? You know, come, anybody else want to come up on the stage with me? Is our mic not working? We good? Okay. Any others? Back. I 
I know, you got your steps in today. Thank you. Online, I have had success in assigning ethical questions to the class because of the honesty you talked about. Yeah. And the fact that there are no right answers, so to speak, but we know where it should head. Right. Uh, can you have a line of how to enlarge the circle of exposure in an online classroom like that? What, what do you mean? Can you? Well, I mean, what other subjects might be appropriate for an open uh, forum? Like oh, what, what what subject do you teach? What area? I teach accounting, so unfortunately, I don't share the freedom of having a lot of right answers. Yeah. Right yeah, answers. yeah. And uh, we try hard. That's all. I'm yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't know much about accounting, but you know, I take a shot. I take a shot. I might have to take your class, man. You know, I might not owe the government next year if I take your class. Um, so, you know, with accounting or you know numbers, one of the things that I would say, you know, sort of to share with them in terms of you know honesty is maybe things that you've experienced, whether you know difficulties, you know, with you know numbers or problems that you've come across especially if you know in practice. So I'm sure you've seen a lot of, you know, cases of, you know, things that went awry that could have been avoided or, you know, you know, stuff like that. I would start to share, you know, some case studies with them, you know, some real life, you know, things that they could dig into. And, you know, you can remove the names and, you know, all of that stuff, but, you know, give them, you know, sort of case studies to, to look at, you know, when it comes to, you know, numbers and accounting and things that they might encounter. That would be, you know, my suggestion. Other people might have, you know, some other stuff that might be in closely related fields. But I love, you know, sort of the problem solving aspect of what the two of you talked about, all right? Put it out there, let them work through it, all right? And, you know, sort of figure it out, yeah. Yeah, I to be another teacher to the I to Right. Um, they've been, and, and my students are part of the country, been hurt by people looking at the news. So I think it's important that when we design assignments or what we think when we're, we're talking about the system, yep. that it, it's not just a space somewhere where we, we're friends and we talk to each other, but that everything that we're doing in the classroom kind of has that same kind of focus. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. It should definitely bleed through and flow through everything. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate all of y'all comments. Y'all should give yourselves a round of applause. Yeah. And so just a, you know, final thought. This is a story I stole from somebody. So if they're watching it, it's on recording. Yeah, yeah, I stole it. So yeah, I started with Darkwing Duck and I'm going to end with a story about balloons. Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, I told you I'm nonlinear. All right, hopefully it makes sense 15 years from now. Right. So this story is about a little boy who you know, went to a carnival for the first time, right? He's never been to a carnival before. And as he's walking around you know, sort of the carnival, he sees a guy you know, with balloons and he's intrigued. He's looking at all these balloons, right? And the guy's filling up a green one and the green one you know, floats. And he fills up a purple one, the purple one floats. He fills up a long one, the long one floats. So all of these sort of shapes and sizes. And, you know, the kid is amazed and he looks at his dad and he's like, how is this possible? And his dad said, you know, it's because of what they, you know, putting in them. And he's like, well, what are they putting in them? And instead of giving them the scientific answer, you know, you know, helium, he was like, they putting the right stuff in them. He was like, and so the, the moral of the story is if you fill your students up with the right stuff, they will rise right to the occasion. They will rise to Olympian heights, stuff that you might not even imagine. So just make sure that y'all filling students up with the right stuff. Right. With that, I say, you know, thank you. I appreciate you. <laughs>